today I want to share with you how to make hash brown breakfast cups. These are so easy to make and they're absolutely scrumptious. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient dense foods like bone broth, ferment, sourdough and more. So if you enjoy learning how to be a modern pioneer in the kitchen, consider subscribing to my channel and don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. And if at any time during this video you want to jump ahead, I'll always have the chapter timestamps for you in the description as well as in the pinned comment. And I'll also have a link there to the printable recipe. Well, to get started for this recipe, the first thing that you're going to need to do is pull out your muffin tin. I'm going to use what we call here in Texas the Texas size muffin pan. And this is going to make six hash brown cups. But you can also use the standard size muffin tin. And this is really nice if you're going to be feeding these to children because they're the perfect size for their hand. Well, I'm going to set my muffin tin aside for now and we're going to go over all the ingredients that you're going to need. Now, the first thing I want to say about the ingredients is that this is an exceptionally versatile recipe. And as I go through what we're going to need to make these hash brown cups, I'll also tell you when you can substitute certain items. So this makes it perfect to make pretty much any time because you can pretty much use anything you have on hand as long as you have potatoes and eggs. Now the first ingredient that you're going to need and the star of the show is one pound of potatoes. And you can use any type of potato you want for this recipe. You can even take a shortcut if you see something behind me in my sink, which we'll talk about in a minute. What I've got here are the thin skinned yellow potatoes. They may also be marketed as Yukon gold potatoes at your grocery store. What's nice about these potatoes, when you grate them up, you don't need to peel these. You can use these with the peel on. And I actually think it brings a little extra crispiness to the final hash brown cup. And the same is true is if you use the thin red skinned potatoes. You don't need to peel those either. So if you're going to be grating potatoes, using the thin skinned potatoes does make this job exceptionally easy. But you can still make these hash brown cups with any potatoes you have on hand. If you do have the baking potatoes that tend to have the thicker skin, all you want to do is peel them and then go ahead and grate them. Now, how much is a pound of potatoes when you grate them? It's really hard to say exactly, but what you're going to be looking for is about three and a half cups of grated potatoes. And saying exactly how many potatoes is going to give you three and a half cups of potatoes, grated potatoes, depends obviously on the size of the potatoes you have. Traditionally, a medium sized potato may give you about three quarters of a cup to a cup of grated potato, uh, but basically just start grating and measure as you go. Now, any type of grater will work to grate your potatoes. I really like this type of grater uh, that has kind of a nice steady foot, so to speak, to it. And you're going to want to use the large grater, uh, the side that has the large grater on it. You can also use one of these handheld graters if this is all you have. And as you grate the potatoes, what I mentioned earlier was just go ahead and measure as you go until you have three and a half cups worth of grated potato. I especially like this grater because it actually comes with this little cup measurement. So I'll just grate three and a half cups of this. This is terrific. And this stores beautifully. It just pops right back in here like that. Uh, I've had this a long time, uh, but I'll definitely see if I can find it online. If so, I'll put a link in the description below. But this is perfect for this job. Now I know some of you have shared with me that you have arthritis in your hands and you don't want to get involved in having to grate potatoes. If you have a food processor, this is the time to pull it out and just use your grating tool that can go ahead and basically do this job in probably 30 seconds or less. And when it comes to using the food processor, just use whatever grating tool you have. Some come with like a slightly larger grater. Some have a little bit of a smaller grater. It doesn't really matter. That's kind of the nice thing about this. It's not an exact science. Either way that you grate your potatoes, even if your handheld grater has smaller grates on it, 
it's going to work out fine. And the easiest option of all is to simply buy potatoes that have been already shredded for you. Now, I have no connection to this company. This is just what I found at my local HEB grocery store. You might have this brand at your grocery store as well or some other brand. The only thing that I recommend, and this is because we're, in, we're trying to create traditional foods kitchen here, we're on our journey. Uh, we want to look for shredded potatoes that contain just potatoes. There are some brands that have a lot of other ingredients added to them, I guess maybe for preservative purposes or whatever the case may be. But if you can and you decide to buy pre-shredded potatoes, try to find those that have an ingredient list that says, and look at this beautiful ingredient list, potatoes. That's what you're looking for. So if you can find something like this that says just potatoes and you wanna take a shortcut, this is the way to go. The only thing you need to remember to do if you decide that you want to use the pre-shredded potatoes is to defrost them. These are going to most likely be sold in the freezer section of your grocery store and you're gonna put them in your freezer when you get home. So just defrost them and then I'm gonna use these so I'll show you the steps that we're gonna to take to prepare them for this recipe as opposed to if we were just grating fresh whole potatoes. Whole potatoes, when you grate them for this recipe, they're ready to go. These have a lot of moisture in them when they defrost, so we're gonna to wanna to squeeze out some of that moisture and get them as dry as we can. Now the next ingredient that you're gonna need is two egg whites and six whole eggs. Now I don't want you to worry about those two extra egg yolks. Those can easily be added to one of the hash brown cups so someone will be lucky and get two yolks. Otherwise you can freeze those two extra yolks and just add them to an egg scramble later on. Next you're gonna want two tablespoons of butter plus extra for when we go to grease our muffin tins. Now, can you use an alternate fat as opposed to butter? Definitely. I like to use butter because I think it's very tasty in this recipe, but you can certainly use olive oil if you'd prefer to do that, or you can even use lard, very tasty, <laughs> or even tallow, beef fat. And if coconut oil is one of the oils that you keep in your traditional foods kitchen, you can certainly use that as well. Next, you're gonna to wanna to have some salt and pepper on hand. Now, how much salt, how much pepper? This is really just a matter of taste. I find that a half a teaspoon of salt works great. I just have a fine ground sea salt here and just a couple of cracks of pepper. And if you wanna kick up the spice a little bit, you can certainly add some red pepper flakes. Now the first two tablespoons of butter that I mentioned are used with making the actual hash brown cups, but we're gonna be filling them with lots of goodies. And so you are gonna need some fat to saute those goodies in. So again, you're gonna probably wanna use butter. I personally find the flavor just can't be beat in this recipe uh, for sauteing the different vegetables that we're gonna be adding to our hash brown cups. Uh, but again, if you wanna use a different fat or an oil that you have in your traditional foods kitchen, that's fine too. You're just gonna need about a tablespoon. And speaking of those extra goodies, those vegetables that we're gonna be adding to our hash brown cups, what I've got here is a red onion a red bell pepper, and then I've just got one of these clamshells of baby spinach. But you have so many options as to what aromatics and vegetables you wanna to add to these hash brown cups. I'm gonna use a red onion because I really like the flavor and it's what I have on hand. You could certainly use a yellow onion or a white onion. You could use some leeks. You could use some shallots. You could use some, uh, like the green onions, the spring onions. Any of those will add wonderful flavor. You could even throw in a little garlic if you like. I find though that, and you know I love garlic, it's the Italian in me, but I do find with these hash brown cups, the garlic can sometimes be a little overpowering, especially if you're serving this to kids or uh, to guests who may not share our love of garlic. And speaking of children and guests, this is a great meal to get ready to serve to folks because it comes together very quickly, especially if you go with the pre-shredded potatoes. And when you serve these, they look very fancy. They look like you went to a lot of effort, which is always nice. You make your guests feel special. 
And you can also serve this in many ways because you can have the egg cup, but well, I call it an egg cup, the hash brown cup with the egg in it, and like a little side salad, sometimes the way you see a quiche served. And if you're serving these to children, and you have the eggs that you've put inside of them cooked to the point where they're still a little runny, you can make some toast finger, fingers and they can use the toast fingers to dip into the runny egg yolk, which is always delicious. Alrighty, but let's get back to the vegetable ingredients. You know me, I can go down a lot of rabbit trails and that's why I always put timestamps in my videos. <laughs> In any event, what I've got here next is a red bell pepper. It's nice to add some type of pepper, some, some type of fresh bell pepper uh, to these. Uh, they add a lot of nutrition. The red bell peppers are especially high in vitamin C, uh, but you really can add whatever you have on hand. If you have a green bell pepper or a yellow bell pepper, orange bell pepper, they'll all work wonderfully. I'm using a red bell pepper because I really like the contrast in color with the greens. Then I've got this clamshell of baby spinach. Just like with all of these ingredients, you can really use whatever type of greens you have on hand. You can use the baby spinach, you can use kale, you can use Swiss chard. I have some wonderful um, sorrel growing out in my garden and I love its lemony, tangy flavor. That would be perfect in this recipe. But I think most folks can find baby spinach, baby kale. Uh, the baby versions work very well uh, because we're going to just saute this up quickly and chop it up a little. Uh, so I, that's why I kind of like the baby versions. But sometimes you see the spring mix and different things like that that come in these clamshells. Any of that will work well. Even, and I have used this and done this in many recipes, even if you just have some romaine lettuce that you feel as you need to be using up, it's perfect for this purpose. And romaine lettuce is actually very nutritious. Now you want about two cups of really well-packed greens. And this clamshell has, I believe it says it's about five ounces. And just from experience, I know that I can mash this into about two cups. I think anybody who's familiar with cooking greens knows that they often cook down to basically nothing. Uh, but this size is perfect. But if you're just cutting up some fresh greens from your garden or your crisper, whatever the case may be, you just want to have two cups of tightly packed greens. Now I just want to take a minute before we move on to the other ingredients to talk about the red bell pepper. What if you don't want to have to cut up a red bell pepper and you're looking for another shortcut like you are with the grated frozen potatoes? Having some jarred pimento on hand can be such a lifesaver. And this is something that you want to keep handy in your working pantry or your prepper pantry. I just want to take a minute to mention something, especially if you're new here. And if you are new here, welcome. But I have a video where I talk about keeping multiple streams of food on hand. And there's a very good reason why you want to do that. First of all, what I mean by multiple streams of food, you probably often hear people say multiple streams of income on various financial news programs, but I like to think of uh, multiple streams in terms of food. And what I mean by that is that you want to have food in various forms. This is fresh and it's going to, it's perishable, and so it's going to rot at some point if you don't go ahead and use this up in a recipe, or pickle it, or ferment it, or home can it, whatever the case may be. However, this is going to have a really nice long shelf life in both your working pantry and your prepper pantry. And now if those terms are new to you, let me share with you that both the working pantry and the prepper pantry are part of the overall umbrella of what I refer to as the Four Corners Pantry. And I have videos all about this. I have videos all about what I mean by uh, multiple streams of food and how to stock multiple streams of food. I also have lots of videos on all about the Four Corners Pantry and specifically how to stock a prepper pantry so you're always prepared for whatever might come our way. And I'll be sure to put links to all of those videos and I've got them all in a playlist for you so it makes it very easy. So I'll put all of those links in the description as well as in the pinned comment underneath this video. 
Now if you decide that you want to use pimentos in this recipe, the only thing that you're going to need to do differently than if you're just cutting up this fresh pepper is you're going to want to rinse these well and then you're going to want to try to squeeze out as much moisture from them as you can. Oh, and I just want to mention, if you are new here, be sure to head over to my website after this video is over and download my free 36-page Essential Traditional Foods Pantry list. It's wonderful, especially if you're on your journey transitioning from what I like to call a processed foods kitchen where you buy a lot of pre-prepared and packaged foods and you're moving along your continuum to creating a traditional foods kitchen where you make more things homemade. This pantry list goes over everything that you want to think about potentially storing in your Four Corners pantry. But it's not just a list. I go over which part of the Four Corners pantry you want to store each item and I also show you recipes for how to use or I link to recipes that have both videos and printable recipes where I show you how to, how to use the things that you stock to make delicious nutrient dense and nutrient rich meals. Plus, I also have lots of tips and tricks in that list as well, uh, especially that are especially helpful if you're new to creating a traditional foods kitchen. The next ingredient that you're going to want to have for these hash brown cups is some type of breakfast meat. I'm going to cook up this bacon and add in some chopped bacon, but you could also use crumbled sausage or if you want to just go very quick and make this extremely easy, you can certainly just chop up some deli ham. And you could even make this sort of like a steakhouse hash brown cup and add in some cooked crumbled ground beef. That would be scrumptious with a sharp cheddar cheese, be delicious. Even maybe some blue cheese. Oh my gosh, I think that would be scrumptious. And if I didn't mention it already, we're going to need one cup of some type of meat and we're going to have it all chopped up. Now, if you have a lacto-ovo vegetarian that you're feeding, someone who takes both milk and eggs, you can certainly just pump up the vegetables in these hash brown cups and leave out the meat. And as I mentioned, if they are lacto-vegetarians, meaning that they do take milk products, you can also just pump up the cheese that we're going to be adding. So some extra vegetables, some extra cheese, whatever works for you and makes it palatable and appetizing for your vegetarian uh, or the family member or vegetarian guest. And speaking of the cheese that's going to go into these hash brown cups, Again, like so much of this, you have so many options. And I highly recommend that you experiment as you make these time and time again, which I know you're going to because they're so delicious. My husband loves pepper jack cheese, so I'm going to go ahead and use this. I also love a good sharp cheddar, so I'm going to add in some of this as well. Now we're going to need a total of one and a half cups of grated cheese. That's about six ounces. So this pepper jack is an eight ounce block. So I'm going to take half of this. And then this is also an eight ounce, eight ounce block. And I'm just going to take a quarter of this. I'm going to add more pepper jack since it is my husband's favorite. But any cheese will work. It can be a hard grated cheese or it can be a soft cheese. You can use things like Parmigiano Reggiano, you can use Pecorino Romano, you could use some ricotta. I love it with, I love anything with ricotta in it. You could also, as I mentioned earlier, use some blue cheese, you can use some goat cheese. Any cheese will work in this recipe, which is what makes it so fabulous. Well, now that we've gone over all the ingredients that we need to make our hash brown breakfast cups, let's start making them. Now what I've got here are eight ounces of bacon and I'm going to go and cook this. I've got it on a foil line sheet just to make the cleanup easy on a baking sheet. And I'm actually going to bake this bacon. And I have a video where I show you how to bake bacon. I get a kick out of saying that, bacon, bacon. <laughs> but this is the easiest way to cook bacon in my humble opinion. So I definitely recommend checking out that video. But it's very simple to do. We're going to line the bacon up on the baking sheet. We're going to put it in a preheated oven that's been preheated to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. 
and we're going to bake it until it's nice and crisp. You know, every piece of bacon is slightly different. It can take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. And once it crisps up and I chop it up, it should be about a cup. But again, it's not an exact science, so I don't want you to worry. Whatever you have on hand will work. If you've got some bacon already in the fridge, and it's already been cooked and you just want to chop that up, that'll work great. If you've got some crumbled breakfast sausage that's already been cooked, uh, that works beautifully. That gives a lovely flavor. My son Ben loves sausage. Uh, the other thing uh, that I mentioned earlier, if you want to be super quick and easy, is just to cut up some deli ham. That works great. And really, you could cut up any kind of cold cut in this. You know, we talked about adding the ground, if you have some cooked ground beef, and sort of do like a steakhouse uh, hash brown cup, that's wonderful. Uh, you could also put some chopped turkey. This is great to do after Thanksgiving if you've got like some extra turkey. Uh, you could do with this with chicken. It, that's what I, I love recipes like this because these are what I call like the clean out the crisper type of recipes. In this case, clean out the fridge. Really little bits and bobs of extra cheese that you have that maybe is drying out and needs to be used up. Some vegetables whatever you have. That's what makes this so fantastic. And it, no matter what you put in this, it comes out tasty every time. Alrighty, well let me go ahead. I'm going to give my hands a little wash and I'm going to go ahead and bake this bacon in the oven, 425 degrees Fahrenheit for about 10 to 15 minutes. Now I do want to mention if you're using ground beef or maybe some breakfast sausage that you've crumbled up and cooked, when you cook either of those, don't discard the fat. You're going to drain it off because you don't want that extra fat in your hash brown cup. It could create a greasier kind of soggy feeling to the whole thing. But don't throw out that fat. Save that fat that comes off of the ground beef. That's a nice beef fat that has a good smoke point. You can use it to saute up vegetables. You can use it to fry in. It's not exactly tallow. Uh, which is the real beef fat in terms of the fact that it's been rendered from suet. And suet is the fat that's around the organs of the cow. And that fat has very little beefy smell to it or beefy taste. It's a very prized fat and it's wonderful for deep frying because it does have a very high smoke point. However, and I have a video where I show you how to render all types of fat, suet uh, into tallow, uh, leaf fat into leaf lard, and that's a prized lard. Uh, but you, it, the same rules apply if you have just back fat from the pig and just to render regular lard, uh, as well as uh, how to render chicken fat to make schmaltz. And uh, you know, as I said, I'll, I'll definitely, I link to as many of these videos and I tend to put everything in playlists for you to make it easy for you. And I'll have all of that in the description as well as the pin comment underneath this video. And if I ever run out of room in the description because you're limited on space, I always put everything in the pin comment. But what I want to mention is save that beef fat because even though technically it's not tallow, uh, it's still very similar to tallow. It'll have a little bit more of a beefy flavor and a beefy aroma, but that can be perfect depending on what you're using it to cook with where you might welcome that flavor. And the same goes for when you cook up some sausage. Drain that fat off and save it. It's wonderful for cooking up vegetables, especially if you're, just, say, just frying up some potatoes on the stovetop. Any type of pork fat is very flavorful. It's also wonderful using for tossing uh, little cubes of stale bread in to make croutons, but you can also make breadcrumbs from stale bread. But it's wonderful, and you know, as I often say this, oh, I have videos on this, but I do have videos on how to make all this stuff homemade, uh, breadcrumbs as well as croutons. And croutons are wonderful whenever they're uh, cooked in any type of lard or pork fat. And so definitely when you cook up that sausage, save that pork fat and use that to saute up potatoes or to make croutons. Uh, my grandmother during the Depression and during World War II when things were very rationed or short supply or expensive, whatever the case may be, she cooked a lot of sausage and she saved all of that fat 
uh, to use in other ways, both baked goods as well as savory goods. Uh, it didn't matter, even sweet baked goods. Uh, she would often use the pork fat. And even to this day, you know, chefs often, they love lard uh, for baked goods and usually leaf lard, which because it doesn't really have the pork aroma. But there are so many ways to disguise that. You know, as I showed you where we used bacon grease uh, to make Depression era peanut butter bread and uh, where we used bacon grease to make the war cake. Uh, anything that may have chocolate or spices, these type of fats that you've saved, whether it's a beef fat from frying up some ground beef or it's a pork fat from frying up uh, some uh, sausage crumbles, uh, or even today, the bacon grease that we're going to. Well, I'll show you how I, I save this after I cook up the bacon. These are wonderful uh, fats that basically are, wind up costing you only pennies. And this way, nothing goes to waste, nothing goes down the drain to clog it or into the garbage. You use this to make the most of the meals that you're making at home, to make the most of the baked goods that you're making at home. Uh, so be sure to, to conserve all of that. Now I'm going to go ahead and measure out three and a half cups of my shredded potatoes. Now you just want to scoop basically. See these are loose. They're not, you know, tightly compacted. You don't want to squeeze the water out of it all first and then pack them into the cups because you'll into the cup measure because you'll wind up with too many potatoes. You just want to scoop it just like I did. There you go. And down into your colander because we're just going to squeeze out as much moisture as we can. Now, don't worry. This is like I said, it's not an exact science. If you have a little more potato, a little more grated potato or a little less pot grated potato, it doesn't really matter. You'll see when we pack them into the cups, there's definitely a lot of, a lot of wiggle room for uh, packing them any, you know, adding a little extra here and there wherever you might need to. Okay, that's my third cup. And now I'm just gonna get a half a cup and we'll be all set. Now all I'm gonna do is take a clean hand and just squeeze this to get out some moisture. It's, you know, none of this, I always liked Emeril Lagasse when he had his cooking show and he would say, it's not rocket science. That's how I really feel about a lot of cooking. It's not rocket science. And many times, yes, we can have the occasional culinary disaster, as I say, but most of the time things will come out okay. You just wanna get as much moisture out as you can. This will help keep the potatoes uh, the hash brown cups when we bake them nice and crisp. Well, that literally only took less than 30 seconds. And you'll see down on the bottom of my bowl here, I squeezed out some of that liquid. So now they're nice and dry and fluffy. That's exactly what you're looking for. The consistency that you're looking for, whether you hand grate fresh potatoes or you use these frozen pre-shredded potatoes, is you want them to just be very light and fluffy like this not clumping together. So even if you find when you grate your fresh potatoes, if they seem to be very wet, then you want to give them a little bit of a squeeze too. But usually they are a little drier uh, than the frozen shredded potatoes. But this is what you're looking for. Just something very nice, light, and airy. Well, this particular brand of grated potatoes, frozen grated potatoes, is one pound 14 ounces. So I definitely have more than I need here for this particular recipe. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this in my freezer. Now I'm just gonna set these aside for a minute and I wanna show you my bacon that just came out of the oven. This just looks glorious and the aroma is fantastic. I really love using bacon in these hash brown cups, but certainly, you know, other meats work, but I, I think probably bacon is my favorite. Uh, this is gorgeously crisp. I'm just gonna uh, remove it uh, from this sheet and I'm gonna put it on a plate and just let it drain a little extra uh, on some uh, paper towels. But it, what I'm gonna do is there is a lot of grease that's pooled in here. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm just gonna drain this bacon grease, the, the bulk of it, right into a little container here. Now, I am not straining this because I am going to use this bacon grease uh, to do things like frying up potatoes, hash browns, uh, as well as potato cubes, whatever uh, I feel like making. 
And so I don't mind the little bits and bobs, so to speak, of uh, the little pieces, the little brown bits that are in here. However, if I was going to use this for baking, I would strain it. And I can still do that if I decide I need this, you know, to make like a peanut butter depression era peanut butter bread or something like that. Uh, then I would just warm it and then I would just run it through a strainer. But truth be told, even with the little bits and bobs in it, when you make these type of baked goods that do have a lot of uh, flavoring to them, like the peanut butter or the various spices uh, that you'd add if you were making the war cake, it was very popular during World War I and it, it stayed popular even to this day, people are still making it, uh, which I showed you how to make. I don't even really think the various bits and bobs are gonna make that big a difference. I'm just gonna let this cool a little, then I'm gonna put a lid on it, and I'm gonna pop it in my refrigerator next to my butter. And so it'll all be ready to use whenever I want it. Uh, you can also freeze bacon grease. It can be very handy if you freeze it in little ice cube trays, and then you just, once it's all frozen, it, 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 it is hard, but there is somewhat of a little bit of a softness to it still. Uh, so generally I don't, I, I leave it in the ice cube trays as opposed to popping it out into some sort of storage container because they can start, start to stick together. Uh, but what's nice is if you have one of those ice cube trays that also has the attachable lids so that everything stays nice and neat and clean and protected from freezer burn and so on and so forth, uh, you can put your bacon grease in there, let it form into ice cube shaped pieces, and then whenever you want to use some fat, as I mentioned earlier, it's really great for frying up potatoes. If, if you have other ideas that, uh, of how you like to use bacon grease in addition to frying up potatoes or maybe sauteing vegetables or using it in some of the Depression era and World War, wor the World War baked goods, both World War I and World War II, let me know in the comments below. But what's great is then now you have these little like cubes, about two tablespoons or so of bacon grease and you can pop it out whenever you want and throw it into your frying pan. Oh, it's also great in homemade cornbread. I like it in that too. So that's definitely something to keep in mind if you want to start storing up your bacon grease like that. This is beautifully crisp. <laughs> I tend to not like to have to use a lot of paper towels, but I will confess when you make bacon and you want to blot the grease, the paper towels work very well for this job. Now I'm just letting that paper towel absorb some of the grease from the bacon, but I wanted to take a second to talk to you about this foil lined pan. Now I know some people don't like to use aluminum foil and I understand completely. It does make the job a lot easier though when you're making bacon, uh, but you can also use parchment paper if you'd prefer that. But what I like to do is kind of get a second use out of this. So if I'm making some type of fish that I'm gonna bake in the oven, I will actually bake it on this pan that has, little, there's still, you know, it's still a little greasy. There's still a little bacon grease on here. And I'll just flip the fish over uh, uh, so that both sides get a little bit of the bacon grease on it, season it up and bake it in the oven. It's delicious. Also on the tip where that I shared with you about saving the bacon grease in the ice cube trays, that can come in very handy for the question that some of you, and actually it's a common question that I get whenever bacon comes up, and it tends to come up a lot here, <laughs> but uh, many of you have said, oh, if you strain it into something like this, and then you make bacon again, and you strain it in, what if, you've not used up what's in here and you're sort of just always adding in bacon grease and at some point you know might what's on the bottom not get used and it might be rancid and so on and so forth all great questions and that would be correct you don't want to keep adding year after year uh, to the bacon grease because at some point yes it would start to take on an off flavor even if it was refrigerated or frozen but what's nice about the ice cube tray trick is that you're freezing it in basically two tablespoons approximately, depending on the size of your ice tray, portions. So you're just popping that out and using it as needed. 
and you can even mark, you know, dates and whatnot on the bottom of the ice cube tray that are easy, you know, to wipe off. You can even use some, like, freezer tape or something like that if you think that you're not going to use the bacon grease up relatively quickly. So those are things to keep in mind. And it really can stay fresh in your refrigerator, gosh, anywhere from six months to a year and maybe up to two years in your freezer. So you, you can get some pretty good shelf life out of this. And I'll go ahead, I find that I don't make bacon as often as I used to because it has become rather costly. Uh, but when I find it on sale, I get a good buy or something, I'll pick up a package and I'll go ahead and use this up pretty quickly uh, for making something like croutons or frying up potatoes. So I don't have so much of a concern like I'm adding a lot of bacon grease to that over the course of multiple years and there's any concern about rancidity. But if you are concerned, the ice cube tray works great. And this is sort of unfood related, uh, but if you self-season your cast iron pans, you don't buy the pre-seasoned ones, you just maybe you find a really nice one at a nice old fashioned one at a garage sale and you clean it up and then you want to season it. I love seasoning my cast iron pans with bacon grease. I think it works really, really well for over time making a beautiful nonstick surface. Uh, tallow and also regular lard work great as well. But these highly saturated fats, I think they work beautiful on seasoning cast iron. Now I'm gonna go ahead and take a sharp knife and I'm just gonna go ahead, listen to that crunch. It's nice crisp bacon. I'm gonna go ahead and cut this up into just small bite-sized pieces. Well, this is my eight ounces of cooked bacon and this should just measure up to be just about a cup. And like I said, not an exact science. If a little more, a little less, it'll just be fine. Now we're gonna go ahead and get our muffin tin ready. But the first thing that you wanna do at this point is be sure to preheat your oven to 475 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we wanna butter our muffin tins, whether you're using the large muffin tin or the ones that have the 12 smaller openings. Just go ahead and butter them generously. You know what works really well for this job? If you get butter in those little wax paper sleeves, saving those in your freezer and then just pulling them out anytime you need to butter something, it works great. Now I'm just gonna use my hand to swirl this around each cup very well. Even if the muffin pan that you're using says that it's nonstick, I still recommend that you butter the muffin tin very well. Now we're just gonna set the muffin tin aside and get to work on our potatoes. I've emptied that potato liquid out of my bowl. And by the way, I wanna mention, don't throw that out. If you've got a sourdough starter, add that to the water that you use to feed your sourdough starter and it will love it. It'll, it'll gobble it right up and really help make, give you a nice bubbly uh, sourdough starter. So now what I'm gonna do is go ahead and just get the shredded potatoes into a nice large bowl here. Now what we're gonna need are those two egg whites. So I'm gonna go ahead and crack these open and just strain out the whites. And then I'm gonna put the extra yolks on the side here. And as I said, you can easily use those by adding them to, a, to one of the cups, or you can save them for a little, you know, extra added yolk to a scrambled egg scramble. <laughs> now all we wanna do is take a whisk and just whisk up these egg whites just a little bit, just to kind of loosen them, kind of lighten them a little. And if you've been with me a while, you know I'm using my magic whisk that I love. This thing is fantastic. It just does such a great job. I use it for every whisking task that I have. And I, I just can't say enough good things about it. Uh, I'll be sure to, I'll link to it. Uh, they're very reasonable and you probably find one at the, in the kitchen aisle at your grocery store or, um, you know, even at just a regular kitchen store locally. Uh, but I'll be sure to link to it below if this is something that you're interested in. They're very, a couple of dollars, very reasonable. And they just work like a charm. I think I shared this with you <laughs> in, in many other videos uh, that I saw Nigella Lawson, the cookbook author, and, and 
uh, I guess I, you know, I say chef, but I love the way she always refers to herself as a home cook, which she is. I think that's wonderful. Uh, but she was using these in one of her videos, and she was just raving about it. And I said, I got to try that. <laughs> and I fell in love with it, too. So just to kind of lighten it up a little, and this we're going to be putting this into the shredded uh, potatoes. Uh, it just helps kind of bind everything together and hold it in place when we pack it into our muffin tins. Now, along with prepping your egg whites for the potatoes, you're also going to need those two tablespoons of butter. I'm just going to kind of eyeball this, and we're going to go ahead and melt that on the stove top since they're going to go in with the, that, the butter's going to go in with the potatoes as well. Now I've got my melted butter and just let that cool just a little bit. And then while we're waiting for that to cool, I'm going to go ahead and add in a half a teaspoon of salt to my potatoes. Now the nice thing about this is, you know, we're seasoning as we go along, so to speak. Uh, but once you take your hash brown cups out of the oven, and you've got all the goodies in there and the egg on top, you can add additional salt and pepper to taste. Now I'm just gonna go ahead and add in a little freshly browned, freshly browned, <laughs> freshly ground, I'm thinking about browning these, freshly ground black pepper. That should be good. Alrighty, now let's drizzle this in. I like to do the butter first and then mix it in with the potatoes, which helps cool it down even more. Uh, because I don't want to cook my egg whites. Now I'm going to go ahead and pour in my egg whites right on top there, and then I'm going to give this all a lovely mix together. Now I'm just going to go ahead and fold in those egg whites with my potato shreds and the butter. It's already smelling good. <laughs> butter makes everything better. Alrighty, once I get this mixed in thoroughly, I want to make sure the egg whites are well incorporated with the potatoes because they kind of kind of they're kind of what's uh, working as our glue in this recipe. To kind of just hold it, these wonderful potato hash brown cups together. Okay, now that we've got that all mixed, we're going to go back and we're going to get our muffin tin. And basically, what we need to do is divide these shredded potatoes amongst all of the muffin tins. So basically what I do, again, just eyeballing it, it's not an exact science. If you put too much in one, you can always take some out and move it to another one. But I'll just usually divide this in half and then each side into thirds so that I have basically what's gonna work out to be one sixth for each cup. Then what you're gonna do is just scoop out a portion and drop it down into your muffin tin. And then you're going to use your hands to just basically press it into the shape of the muffin tin. <laughs> ah. So you're just going to push it up the sides. That's basically it. You're just sort of making, just think of sort of like a little no roll pie crust. I think I've showed you in a video how to make a no roll pie crust. This is basically what you're doing, but on a muffin tin level. Now, I will give you a tip for this. Don't over potato them, so to speak. Don't over fill these. Just press best you can to, to basically put them in the shape of the muffin tin, but don't make it too thick. The secret is that you keep it kind of thin and that's what's going to make them nice and crispy. Well, I've got the cups all prepared here. They look like little nests. I like them. <laughs> so now I'm going to go ahead and put these in my oven. It's preheated. It just hit 475, 475 degrees Fahrenheit. So I'm going to go ahead and pop these in. They take about 15 minutes to become golden. You don't want them to get too dark, so you want to keep an eye on them because every oven is different. Your oven may take 10 minutes. They may take a little longer than 15 minutes, but generally 15 minutes is about the average at 475 degrees Fahrenheit, but just keep an eye on them. You're looking for them to be golden and because we're going to take them out and fill them and they're going to go back in the oven so they do get to cook a little longer and that's when they'll get like a little crisp and a little more golden brown along the edges. But at this point we just want them to become nice and golden. 
Well, while those little potato nests, or hash brown cups, are baking, I took a little time to clean up, and now we're going to prepare the filling. Now, you're going to want to use about a tablespoon of butter or other fat. You can certainly use olive oil or any of the, of the other fats that we talked about earlier. And you just want to go ahead and put that into a frying pan on your stovetop. And for those of you who have asked about my little tabletop cooktop here, it is made by Cuisinart, and I think it's still available. I've had it a while, but I think it is still available. I'll be sure to put a link in the description underneath this video. Uh, the only thing I will say about it, yes, I am happy with it, but it does run hot. So you do need to be a little careful uh, if you are using it to cook. But I find that it comes in very handy uh, for water bath canning. So, you know, as we go into gardening and then harvesting season, and if you're going to be doing some canning, uh, having a little stove, a little tabletop burner like this comes in very handy. And, uh, and I'm very pleased with this. And I've had it a while and it's still going strong. So I've got this on medium heat. And I'm going to go ahead and chop up my onion and my bell pepper. And we're just going to do bite-sized slices, or bite-sized pieces. <laughs> now remember, don't throw out any of your onion skins. These are loaded with nutrition, and you want to be sure to put these in your scrap bag in your freezer to save for whenever you're making a bone broth, or a broth, or a stock. Uh, and even if they're not animal-based, still save this because you can add these to your vegetable broths. I've showed you how to make a couple of mineral broths. Throw in your onion skins. They're very, very nutritious. And as I said, we're just going to do bite-sized pieces. Nothing fancy. And be sure to save the root too. Save it right along with your onion skins. And as we chop these pieces up, we're just going to go ahead and add them right into our frying pan here with the melted butter, nice and sizzly. And I'll finish chopping up this onion, then we'll move on to the red bell pepper. And all we're going to do is start sauteing all of this up until it gets nice and soft. I'm going to go ahead at this point and add in a, a half a teaspoon of salt to these veggies that we're going to be sauteing here and a little bit of black cracked, cracked pepper. That'll be perfect. As I said, you can always season these again right on top of the egg when you're ready to serve them. Now we'll go ahead and we'll cut up our pepper. Again, just into bite-sized slices, nothing fancy. Don't throw this out. Add this to your scrap bag. All of this has nutrition and flavor. Now I've got my sweet red bell pepper all cut up, and I'm going to go ahead and add this in with the onions uh, so that it'll soften. Now, if you decided to take the shortcut and use the jarred pimentos from your pantry, you don't need to add them uh, to the onions to cook and to soften since they're basically already soft and cooked. You'll add them in when we go ahead and add in the greens and the bacon where we're just kind of warming things through. Well, while I was sauteing this, the oven beeped and these were ready in just about 15 minutes. So you can see how precious they are, aren't they just darling? <laughs> and they're nice as you see. They're just sort of golden, a nice golden brown with a little bit of crisp, crispness around the edges. And I just wanted to mention that if for any reason you find that they're getting a little overly crisp around the edge, especially since we're going to be putting them back in the oven, you might, I noticed that this one I think got a little short change, this kind of a little one. Uh, it, but it, what I did was I just, for like the last minute or two of baking, I just tented it with foil. So that's a, just a little tip, something that you can do. But they, they gold, goldened up <laughs> beautifully. Well, the onion and pepper have sauteed up beautifully. They're nice and soft. I'm going, I'm going to go ahead and set the uh, hash brown breakfast cups aside for a minute and grate the cheese. Now, as I mentioned, we, we need about six ounces of cheese. We need about a, one and a half cups of grated cheese. So I'm going to cut this in half, which will be four ounces, and I'm going to get the other two ounces from the sharp cheddar. Now I highly recommend 
that whenever you do recipes like this that call for grated cheese, to just buy some cheese, a block of cheese, and grate it yourself. It's less expensive and you don't get the additional ingredients that often need to be tossed with grated cheese, pre-prepared grated cheese uh, that they have for sale at the grocery store so it doesn't all clump and stick together. And I'm just going to eyeball this. <laughs> a little extra cheese, a little less cheese, it's not going to be the end of the world. Now I'm just going to go ahead and grate this cheese because this will go right into our hash brown breakfast cups after we put in the vegetables. Now some folks like to put the cheese on top of the egg. I prefer it underneath the egg and the cheese kind of gets all lovely and melted on top of the veggies. Uh, that way when you bring them to the table it's more the egg showing as the star of the show rather than covered with the cheese. But really it's personal preference. It's totally up to you. Just be careful when you if you're grating your cheese on something like this. I, when I do the very final last pieces I go very gently with my hand. Now that I've got the cheese shredded we're just going to set that aside for a minute while we go ahead and prepare our greens. Now I have to tell you something funny about greens that come in a clamshell like this. I once saw a video, and I think this is an old one, I think Jacques Pepin, it was Jacques Pepin, I know that, and I believe he was teaching his daughter how to cook. And he had some greens like this. And if you ever notice, if you buy these, they will often say right on the front here, triple washed. And Jacques Pepin was saying how his wife, when she was alive, she never trusted that someone else had actually triple washed the greens and she would always wash them. And he and the daughter had a, a good laugh about that. But I also found it so funny because my mother would say the same thing. She wasn't going to trust anyone who had washed the greens and claimed that they had been triple washed. She felt that no one was going to wash the greens the way she would wash them and make sure they were really clean. So I always thought that was very cute. And so I'm just going to go ahead, since that's what I, how I was raised, I'm going to give these a little bit of a wash. Uh, besides most of the greens my mother uh, was using, uh, they didn't have this back then. They often just had, uh, you know, a, 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 some spinach or some lettuce or a head of it, you know, and it had a lot of dirt in it and whatnot. And she'd soak it in a bin and all of that. I'm sure many of you are familiar with preparing greens that way. Uh, but when this became more modern and whatnot, she would often say, triple washed? Oh, no, I don't think so. I'll be washing it. Well, already now my greens are quadruple washed. <laughs> now, if you want, you could run a knife over this to maybe chop it up a little. I don't really find it necessary, especially if you've got the baby varieties, uh, because this is really going to wilt down to very little once it gets into the frying pan. And I don't worry about the stems either, since this is the baby variety, these are very tender. So I'll just go ahead now and put these right in with the pepper and the onion. I think this is going to be delicious. <laughs> Alrighty, I'll get the rest of this in and then we'll just uh, twirl it all around in the pan to help this wilt. And then at the last minute we'll just go ahead and add in our bacon just to warm through. I really enjoy watching Jacques Pepin cook and I think I've got all his cookbooks. Uh, my mother and I really enjoyed him. We would always watch the various cooking shows, and this is way before there was, uh, you know, the cooking channel. So this one guy went overboard and put him back in. <laughs> and we really enjoyed it. We would watch Jacques Pepin, Julia Child, of course, Natalie Dupree, the Southern cooking. My mother liked her very much. Yan Can Cook, he was always fun with various Asian dishes. Of course, the Galloping Gourmet. Graham Kerr, Kerr, if I'm saying his name correctly, he was always a lot of fun to watch. And uh, oh, the one I remember my father really liked the Louisiana uh, cook. Justin, was his last name Rhodes? You have to tell me, am I saying the right name? I can't remember his last name, but he was so funny. He's an older gentleman. And I loved the way he used to say, I guarantee, you know, that it was going to be delicious. It was very cute. 
I love those shows on PBS. You have to tell me in the comments what are some of your favorite shows that maybe you grew up watching uh, with your mom or dad or your grandparents on PBS back when that was basically our only choice if we wanted to watch cooking shows. And they were wonderful. Th those are still my favorite. It's funny, with all the fancy things on uh, Food Network and what's the other one? It's just called Cooking the Cooking Channel. It just, there's just something so special about those old shows. And I hope that's really, in a way, something I've tried to emulate here on YouTube. So I hope that, uh, I, I may not be fancy and splashy and all of that, but hopefully uh, you enjoy being on this traditional foods journey with me. So yeah, let me know. Tell me what were some of your, maybe your favorite cooking shows on the PBS network. All righty. Well, this is beautifully wilted. You'll see the greens basically cooked down to such a small amount. It's amazing. You know, the other day I had one of those entire clamshells of arugula. I love arugula. And I cooked it up and put it in, an, I made it a little omelet, and literally one clamshell of arugula, this is why you have to grow greens, one, shell, one clamshell of the arugula went into that whole omelet. But I felt so virtuous eating all those greens. But I do like my greens cooked. I'm not uh, one too much for the raw, the raw greens. I do, I do like them cooked. Uh, and the kale chips are fun. I'm so late coming to that party. When, when were they popular? Like 10 years ago? Uh, but I enjoy making kale chips now and again. Those are fun to munch on. Alrighty, well now that the greens have wilted beautifully, I'm just going to go ahead and add in this bacon just to warm it through. I mean, it's going to get warmed through regardless because we're going to put these all back in the oven once we uh, mix all this together. So, but you know, if you've got some deli ham, uh, you know, just throw it in now. It's a little easier to mix anyways once it's in the frying pan. And that, that really, oh, this bacon smells so good as I'm, as I'm mixing it as the heat hits it. Uh, but uh, yeah, like I said, you can throw in your deli ham, your ground beef, your crumbled sausage, whatever you want that's already been cooked. Now what I'm gonna do is take a little spoon here and start spooning this mixture down into our little hash brown cups. And really, all you, you know, all you're looking for is to just fill it, allowing, maybe you could say three quarters of the way through, you just want to allow enough room left over to crack the egg on top. Well, I've got my hash brown cups filled with our delightful mixture. I've also got a little cook's treat here. <laughs> I, I think there was a little extra, so I left that in the frying pan. And I've mixed the cheddar and the Monterey Jack together. And now all we're going to do is just go ahead and sprinkle a little bit right on top. Now, I don't want you to worry because I know you're thinking, oh, we got to put the egg in there too. That's okay because this is all going to cook up gorgeous and the egg will more or less be held in place kind of by the muffin tin. Trust me, it's going to cook up beautifully. And any cheese that melts that maybe runs down the side, oh gosh, all the better. <laughs> it's just going to be kind of have a nice little crispiness to it, nice taste. It'll be lovely. So I'm just going to keep going around, working my way, dividing this cheese up amongst these six cups. First, I want to get some on every single cup and then I'm gonna go back and add some extra. Well, I've got all the cheese evenly divided among these six hash brown breakfast cups. Now, the next step is for us to crack our eggs and put the eggs on top of the cheese. But before we crack these eggs and put them on top of the cheese, I wanna go over the cooking times with you. How long you put these back into the oven for depends on how you like your eggs. If you like your eggs when they're sunny side up, meaning that the whites are cooked but the yolk is very runny, then you're probably going to leave these in the oven somewhere between maybe five to seven minutes. Just keep an eye on them. But you wanna make sure that the whites are well cooked. If you like your eggs over easy, where there's a little film that's been cooked on top of the yolk, 
then you're probably looking at maybe seven to nine minutes. And if you do like your eggs over easy in that style, you may find tenting your muffin tin with aluminum foil will help that process along, help that white film to form over the yolk and cook it a little, just like if you had flipped it in your frying pan. Now, if you like your eggs over hard, then you probably want to go a little past nine minutes. And just like with over easy, you may find tenting your muffin tin with aluminum foil helps that process move along. Now we tend to like our eggs sunny side up. So I'm gonna go ahead and crack these eggs right on top and then put them, I'm not gonna cover them with foil. I'm gonna put them back into the oven. I'm gonna watch them and somewhere between five and seven minutes, they should come out beautifully. I'm just gonna go ahead at this point and put a little salt and pepper. I think that that'll be nice. You can certainly do this when you bring them to the table but I think this is gonna really add some nice flavor at this point. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put this nice cracked black pepper. Oh, this is gonna look lovely. Okay, now we're just gonna go ahead and get ready. We'll go and put these in the oven that's already hot, 475 degrees Fahrenheit, and we're just gonna keep an eye on these until these eggs are sunny side up. Well, these were in my oven for just about seven minutes, and I think they're perfect. The whites are cooked through, and the yolks are still quite jiggly. So they're, they're, definitely, they're definitely cooked sunny side up. Now, the easiest way to get these out and serve them is just to use a knife, or if you have a little icing spatula like this, this works very well too. And you're just gonna lift it out. You're gonna leave them in the pan for a few minutes just to the point where you can easily handle them. But look at this gloriousness. Can you even believe it? Well, I can't wait to slice into this and I'll give you a close up so you can see exactly how they bake up. Oh my gosh. I love the jamminess of the egg. Delicious. Boy, this looks good. <laughs> What a treat this is gonna be when you bring these to the table. You're gonna get lots of oohs and ahs. Alrighty, now let's give this a taste test. That's the ultimate test. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, those are delicious. Oh, that's delicious. You're gonna love this. Now, if you want some more wonderful, tasty, and easy breakfast ideas, like a strata made with leftover bread, sourdough pancakes, sourdough waffles, and lots more breakfast ideas, be sure to click on this video over, over here where I have a whole playlist for you with all of those that I mentioned and more. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.